Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all our listeners and viewers. Uh, my name is Noor Kabara and welcome to uh, Under the Minbar second episode. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we come to you live from the Al Bayan radio station over here in beautiful Belmore. And with me today, uh, a very special guest and a close friend of mine, Ustaz Muhammad Khadr. Assalamu alaikum, Ustaz. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Akhnur. Alhamdulillah. Tayyib, but I thought I'll get started and uh, <coughs> give a bit of reflection on the last episode we had. We're talking about dunya and brands and, and being conformist and following trends and so on and so forth. And uh, Sheikh Nassim Berkulofi was mentioning that, look, it is natural for the human being to just be a conformist and follow certain trends. And he gave great advice on how uh, it's very important to pick and choose very wisely and carefully who it is that we follow uh, because it is something natural that we do do. So I will remind our listeners and viewers once again to look deeply and think deeply about who it is you find uh, inspiring in your life and who you believe you should be following. You know, all these people that we may see on Instagram and Facebook uh, as influencers or so on and so forth. A lot of the times they're just fake people. Um, you know, people just out there creating an image to make money, to create some wealth, you know, to live a certain lifestyle that is specific to this current world, you know, specific to this dunya only, not targeted towards the hereafter. So the way we should be living and the way we should be conforming is towards a life where we're thinking about the hereafter and thinking about the future. Uh, I mean, after all, I mean, they say, uh, you know, the only thing you have guaranteed in this life is taxes, but uh, <laughs> in some countries nowadays, even that's even that's <laughs> put out of the picture. But the one guarantee we can say is death. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a deep topic. Uh, it's not something we are going to talk about, but it is there, and it is something that we definitely need to prepare for. So uh, my reflection from the last episode, I can definitely say that uh, Sheikh Nasim and, and Dr. Omar gave some great feedback and great advice towards who we do probably need to look up to and who we may you know need to think about following so that we aren't following the trends of people who maybe just focus only on uh, this world and this life only uh Stez muhammad did you have any uh any chance to listen to the last episode yes i uh i think i feel about half an hour of that okay i saw it was about now yeah it minutes. was quite long <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i managed to fit half an hour today it was a uh, very um hot conversation mm. with uh, a lot of contribution from uh, sheikh nasim and uh, dr Omar khair, with a lot of insight from their experiences yes alhamdulillah Taib. uh i'll quickly ask uh probably a few people out there that don't know too much about yourself but if you can shed some light, uh, maybe on who you are, where you grew up, where you studied, what you cover in uni, uh, maybe what you're doing these days, you know, how we've come to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think the show was going to be about me. Yeah, but. sorry, mate. <laughs> I'll put you in the deep end straight away. <clears throat> but, um, look, I've had the, uh, the rare opportunity to live part of my life in Lebanon and... Uh, I'd say the majority of my um, older years in Australia. And How uh, old were you when you came over here? Look, the first time when I came here, I was six. But All then right. I actually went back to Lebanon and studied for a few years. And uh, just a, a message for all the young fathers out there and the young mothers. SubhanAllah, uh, when I went to Lebanon, I only went there for like, I don't know, three to five years. Uh-huh. And during that time, I went to a private Islamic school. Big shout out to Madis al Iman al Islamiyah in Abu Samra. <laughs> um, I went there for like three to five years. And that was just, those, those specific particular years in that particular age. Look, when I came back, I came to the end of year seven, right? So all the parents that are listening, I came to the end of year seven. Um, and I mean, by the time I came to year seven, the year was finished. But those three to five years before then, um, they gave me my Arabic language. No? Yeah. They, they gave me my Arabic language, but they gave me my Quran. They <coughs> gave me my 
um, you know, um, Islamic education. I went to the Islamic school for those number of years and that just clinched it for me. You know, ever since then, I mean, you know, you stay in the circles of Arabic, you stay in the circles of Quran, you stay close to the language. I, st I still remember Sheikh uh, Saeed Al-Awik, Hafizahullah, he said that the best way to maintain your Arabic language is through the Quran. So when you stay in that environment, you keep it. But when you're out of that environment, you lose it. If you're going to not expose yourself to any kind of Arabic, you, you'll lose it. So it's because of those specific years, it just clinched it. And, you know, it was a stroke of genius from my parents, Hafizahum Allah, um, to take me to Lebanon or, you know, to any Islamic Arabic country for, for the listeners. And it just it did the trick. And since then... You know, I've been known as the like the bilingual, very good in Arabic, very good in English. It was because my parents sent me to, you know, when those specific years in Lebanon, <coughs> and, and that, that did the trick for me. Um, and uh, but by 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 far, I mean, since like I said, year eight, been in um, in Australia, attended university in Australia, and now I'm a school teacher. What did you study in uni? Well, my first degree was um, business, economics and marketing. And the uh, the next one was graduate diploma in like teaching. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, it's like a qualification. So is that how, that's how you got into the teaching field? Yeah, yeah, formal teaching. Because <coughs> I was teaching before by virtue of the Arabic knowledge. You know, anybody okay. who knows a bit of Arabic can kind of teach basics, I guess. Yeah. Um, and the last one was uh, a master of of art classical arabic yep at charles Sturt university through isra uh -huh. um you're into your books huh well i like studying at university i don't know how much i remember <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm not about to give you a whole course in um you know in the <coughs> arabic language uh may allah subhanahu our award uh ustad abdul hadi shahadil I mean. tabarakallah he was he was an amazing <coughs> teacher at isra um and yeah like you're just living in Australia, living in the West. You, I remember some of the stuff from Lebanon, yeah. you know, and the environment there and, and the culture, definitely. I recall a lot of the culture, but I'd have to say, man, I'm, I'm a bit Aussie through and through. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the way you speak <laughs> English, man, and uh, yeah. you got the you definitely got the lingo for sure. <laughs> so you've been teaching since you finished uh, university. Is that what you've been doing predominantly? Look, hello, where, where I'm teaching at the moment, um, it's, it's, this is my 12th year. 12th year teaching. Yeah, in a in a formal setting. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I was teaching a little bit before that as well, um, with Al Firdaus, so it's it's a little bit more than twelve years. Yeah. Um and you know, like if if you got a knack for it or if you've got an interest in it, always involved in Dawah. Yeah. You know, involved with the youngsters, whether they're little kids or they're just the youth. Yeah. You know, in the masajid in the centers. <coughs> You know, once you enter that stuff, you can't just you, you can't leave it. You know, it is definitely hard on, yeah. on one level or another. Hard to walk away. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe the the brothers nesting at CYC at the moment would say, "I don't, we don't know what he's talking about. We hardly see the bloke." Mm. But uh, <laughs> well, when I'm free, I go. When you're free, you do what you do, right? That's how it is. <laughs> yeah. Know. Have you mainly been teaching young? I mean, what what are the age groups in the twelve years? Has it? Uh, well, funny enough, in the in the first few years, I was teaching uh, kindergartens, year ones, year oh, twos. Oh, right. Yeah, and then um, when I moved away from Islamic studies and, and Quran and started doing, you know, commerce, business studies, uh, <coughs> PDHPE, and then that that was in, of course, senior school in high school. Yeah. 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 So that's okay. Is the show finished now that we know everything <laughs> about Muhammad Khalil? What have you been doing recently, more <laughs> the the older guys, uh, you know, the teenage boys in high school? Hello, look, my um, my position currently at uh, where <coughs> I work at the school is the unenviable position of dealing with um, uh, the well being of uh, student boys. Okay. Right. So issues we are having you know all the time uh, at school with with kids who uh, kind of get themselves in trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and my experiences aren't necessarily just unique or exclusive to where I work. Yeah. Um, my, you know, you see these issues pop up, not just like generally everywhere. You hear the du'at speaking about it, the mm. mashaykh talk about it. <coughs> when you have a conversation with, with parents, they have that, uh, you know, they have these similar issues with mm. their boys, with their girls, in the public system, in the private system. 
uh, there's definitely a consistency in the West. You know, even some of the issues uh, that happen in the West full stop. Yeah. You know, not just Australia, but, you know, any other Western country. So so maybe you can shed some light for us. Um, I've also played now, you know, uh, alhamdulillah, last couple of years been teaching the teenage boys at Alfred Dos where we work yeah. together. Yeah. And... You know, as you were saying, you see a lot of issues and all that sort of thing that arise from where we are and where we live. No. For me personally, I've I guess I've seen the desire for, I guess the the high life, the luxury life. Um, you know, potentially consuming alcohol, going out clubbing. There's a huge interest in girls. Are, are they? the sort of issues you, you feel like you're coming across or what's the one thing that stands out or that's been more prominent from what you see from the from the brothers um, that come towards you with issues or the things that you have to deal with at the school? Look, uh, generally speaking, um, one of the things that Islam emphasizes is discipline. Mm. Discipline, control, um, controlling the nafs, having control of the nafs. Enslaving the nafs rather than being enslaved to the nafs. Whereas one of the challenges for sorry, what's sorry, just for our listeners and viewers, the nafs is the nafs. Okay, the nafs is is just a just a, a minute, maybe like sum the self, it up. really the self. Mm. You know, your desires, your wants, your needs, your your person. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of the the challenges for the youth is that um, sometimes in society the nafs is set free. Mm. You know, apart from anything that's illegal, which you will be punished for committing. Yeah. You know, um, go for your life. You know, whatever you feel, whatever you think, whatever you want to do, go and do it. Mm. And um, it's from the moral character of a believer to have his nafs controlled and disciplined. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to control your nafs and discipline your nafs, it's because of high moral character. Mm. So if you don't really see a value in high moral character, there's really nothing stopping you from doing whatever you want. If that's not a value that you possess, and also within the din, when you have the faith that tells you that there's a day of judgment, that Allah is watching you, that there's a recompense on the day of judgment, and there are so many other verses in the Quran, you know, and you know that there are consequences in the hereafter that kind of hold you back. If you don't have that iman, if you don't have that value system, then you can do whatever you want and you will do whatever you want. You you will break all the rules in Islam, so to speak, mm. because it's not because it's legal or because nobody will hold you up for it unless you're you know except for your like your nagging parents or you know there's annoying teachers. But apart from that, when it comes to music. Girls, you know, trying stuff, you know, if you can get away with it, why not? You know, so a lot of the times it's a, it's the difficult process of giving the kids those values, mm. you know, and with those values, it's those values that made the, the companions, radiallahu anhum, <coughs> discipline themselves. It's those values that really freaked out the companions and, and, and it made them think twice and three times about ever doing anything. That would, you know, upset Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or get him in trouble. Do you think uh, Do you think it's a bit tough when you come and, and try to put forward these values that the kids switch off automatically as soon as you say they have anything remotely related to do with, say, Islam and our deen? I mean, I've found sometimes in, in a class when I speak to some of the young boys... As soon as you relate, as soon as you relate something, you know whether it be good manners or re- being respectful to parents. As soon as you say, "Oh, and, and this is in the Quran or this is in our our Deen," there's a bit of a switch off button that comes up. But if you were to exclude that, they're a bit more uh, forthcoming towards it for some reason. Look, um, you probably agree um, that. Uh when you want to pull the youth in to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and invest in their own hereafter, you find that there's a struggle on both sides. <coughs> on one side, the obvious side, you have peer pressure that plays a very, very big role. Huge, I think, right? yeah. Peer pressure. And peer pressure also exists in a setting, and this setting is popular culture. What hap- what's, what's popular in society? Yeah. 
you were speaking about fashion uh, the last the first episode the last uh, episode that you had um brand names music movies celebrities anything out there every, I mean, all the listeners they know yeah. what's what's popular these days and the need for the youth to fit in yeah they want to belong they want to fit in they want to yeah, feel like they're important. pressure yeah, yeah they want to feel like they're important that they count mm. you know they want their friends to laugh when they speak they want what they say to matter they want to know they're coming to school or to a group knowing that they've got their place and they belong. Mm. This is very, very important for them. And so this then acts as a type of, what's the word? It's uh, it's almost like a drug that when they're in that zone, mm. they don't think for themselves anymore. You know, they just go with the flow. They just do what everyone else is doing because they want to fit in. Yeah. Maybe Maybe some of them who still have, and I'll get to the other side in a minute, Maybe some of them who don't agree fully with everything that's that's done. When they're alone, maybe they feel a bit relieved that they don't have to be that person anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's on one side. And then and then the music and the music videos and, and you know, some some of the messages in the lyrics of, of songs, um, the messages in like what people see and, and what they watch on T V shows. And all of that's exploded with, with, you know, you got your Netflix and you've got your YouTube and now making videos and product shows and like it's, there's just so much of it out there. There is, It's a there very, is. very strong mm. force, it's avalanche, mm. you know, and you'd be very lucky to find somebody who's been sheltered mm. unless they just don't have a, I, <coughs> I, I remember kids at school just weren't interested in music, they didn't yeah, like music. Yeah, yeah, Or some people are just not movie people, mm. you know, so they'd be somewhat removed from that environment. Um, and some people they don't care if they're alone at school, for example. So you get some some. That's very rare, though. You very very rarely come across maybe right. a, a teen. Yeah. So that's who doesn't care about that much. There's a struggle on what with with that on one hand. Mm. On the other hand, you know, I have to say the uh, the the glimmer of hope, uh, <coughs> Noor, and uh, the, I'm sure th- I'm sure the list the listeners they um, they they can and you speak of this themselves is that do not underestimate the fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed mm-hmm. in the heart of these youth the fitrah you know the fitrah that's it's unbreakable and unfortunately the awliya of the shaitan they want to break that fitrah mm. they want to destroy that fitrah they want to yani that fitrah they consider that fitrah embarrassing they can fi- they want they want you to think that this fitrah is backwards mm. you know they want to break down this fitrah Right and completely smash it so they can control the inner core of the human and how he thinks and how he how yeah. he behaves. Right, you will find <coughs> that by default without instruction. Right, even the biggest aasi, the biggest young youngster who is a aasi, who yeah. is a fasiq, who is off off the rails completely. Inevitably, once he sees a sheikh, it's like automatic respect. Yeah, he gets embarrassed. He gets shy. He doesn't yeah. even know who he is. Yeah. He could be just a young youngster, normal bloke wearing a abaya. Mm. He respects the abaya. He respects the beard. He respects the hijab. Yeah, that's still a fitrah in him that's still not damaged. You know, when you take him to a masjid, he feels shy. He feels embarrassed. He feels guilty. He feels yani overwhelmed by this feeling. Yani he just feels like I'm in I'm in a masjid. I'm in the house of Allah. When Ramadan comes around, when Eid comes around, you know, if you say. Uh, Muslim or Islam they've just they've still got that yeah there's seed something inside of them inside that kind of, of kicks them, yeah. you know what I mean so hello, I'm sure we're not going to talk at the moment in this episode we're not going to talk about unf- those unfortunate souls who've completely lost their fitrah as well mm. you know what I mean which is a serious <coughs> serious situation I found Allah mm. but the general the general youth you know, I, I used to go to give a khutbah at your, you know, your typical "Quote unquote troublesome public school yep. with a lot of Muslim kids, yeah. and you'd go into the hall, and you'd have like hundreds of these Muslim kids listening to the khutbah. Yani, you would absolutely blast them for the things that you hear that they do yeah. in and outside of school. You would not hear a peep from any one of them. You would hear a pin drop. So, like, you'd get a deputy or a principal coming in saying, "Like, how do you do this? Mm. Like, how do you get all these kids to sit still and listen while you tell them off?" Meanwhile, they don't they don't take one word from yeah. if they don't want to listen to a particular yeah. teacher, they will turn the in class it's probably right. upside down. They'll yeah. flip the place upside down and be so uh, <coughs> defiant. Mm. How do you do it? But it's it's not in the individual who's coming. Who's coming? The kids understand this is a khutbah. Mm. This is this is din, right? 
and uh, they they feel that guilt they feel that embarrassment they feel that obligation to do the right thing and that that comes from the fitra mm. so you want to support the fitra you know you want to yani boost that fitra you want to you want to tap into that fitra and when you tap into that fitra with things that make sense to the fitra and the kids they understand that you know what you what you're saying makes sense mm. it's striking a chord that's when you bring him into the masjid that's when they feel right they feel like i'm in the right place at the right this is this is the right thing to do yeah and even the biggest osad the biggest kids who do the wrong thing mm. yani a lot of the times they don't feel good about what they're doing you know they may on the spot but later they'll think this is bad when they're getting reminders from their parents when they they come across a sheikh or and they feel bad about what they've done so the guilt is there but they just keep doing it they just keep doing it. they just keep doing it mm. but when you support that fitra and you tap into that fitra and you speak to them from that little bit of iman that's still in their heart and you nourish it and you help it grow and you show them that you do belong that this is just a sin but this is not you you mm. are not of the inhabitants of the hellfire you are not in your essence a fasiq or a munafiq or a, or a, you know you're not on yani no like Allah is forgiving Allah is merciful yeah. you just need to repent there's always the door of the masjid is always open your iman is still there just nourish it it's very simple to do small kinds of yani small acts of good deeds you don't have to go to hajj or give half your money away and when they see that they real they realize <coughs> that you know what I'm I'm still in this I'm still in the din I can still belong I can still you know so it's it's that struggle it's that struggle where you want to pull the kids in you know to listen to their fitra to feed their iman you know and stop fighting it stop mm. fighting their fitra stop trying to break down their fitra because when they're listening to the you know, the soldiers of shaitan that's what they're doing they they're challenging their fitra all the time mm. they're trying to beat down their conscience until they don't feel bad at all about what they do well mm. and that's uh, that's that's the worst case do you think um <coughs> sorry just for the listeners and viewers uh Aasi is, is is someone that um you know, does bad acts and disobeys Allah so to speak and the fitra is the natural disposition uh, of a person's you know, soul so to speak so uh, an example of, of fitra would be you know like uh, Stas Muhammad was saying it's just natural that we as humans don't like to see murder you know, that's just a natural disposition of the body it's just and it's naturally to you know uh, natural to to love nicely scented things or, or you know love your mum for care all these sort of yeah, things care yeah for care for kids, kids and, and things like that so yeah so that that's a quick definition on those two but going back to um something you said when you were talking about the pressure that uh, some of the teens might go go through do you think do you think potentially some of this could stem back from home if there was enough done at home in some cases where there's a lot of good attention and good vibes coming from home that the kids might not have to feel like they do a lot of this thing and then in in saying that to add to that how much does a parent need to be kind of informed and in with it so to speak with what's going on so that they know what type of attention to give to their kid so that they're not seeking it from the outside world because these days and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our you know, daughters and, and, and sons from all this stuff that's happening. A lot of the things I've been shown lately is young girls in high school searching for attention from from anyone. And it always gets me thinking like, is this because things at home, you know, they're not getting attention at home or they're just, is, is it because there was too much attention at home and that standard hasn't been kept and now they're looking for it elsewhere? So with that point you made where they might go to school and have peer pressure to fit in and do sort of, you know, do silly things and do things that they might not feel comfortable doing, could that potentially be fixed, um, you know, back behind the doors as they say at home? Hello, look, I mean, <coughs> with regards to you know, bringing up children, my, my kids are still young, but as you can imagine, Everybody has some sort of responsibility bringing up children. Yeah. This is, the whole society has a responsibility. Parents have a responsibility, definitely. They may have the most responsibility. The imam in the masjid has a responsibility. Mm. You know, the peers amongst each other, they have responsibility. The teachers at school, institutions, they have responsibilities. Governments have responsibility. Everybody has some sort of responsibility. 
and I, I would say it's you know it's uh, it's obvious to say that parents have a big chunk of that responsibility if yeah. not the biggest responsibility um, and look I mean to be practical um, kids in a household um, they may have any one of a million different circumstances that they, that they live in mm. you know gone are the days where <coughs> Um, kids used to live in a loving home with a father and a mother mm. in a traditional setting. Yeah. And they have, you know, dinner at six o'clock and they go to bed by eight o'clock and everybody's having breakfast in the morning the next day and everybody's lovey-dovey. Yeah. You know, like that, I think that just exists in movies now. Yeah. You know? These days, yeah. Yeah, you know, like especially in in, uh, in Australia um, with an economy so strong, mm. you've got both parents who are working. Yeah. You know what I mean, and and the kids are on routines and they're independent. They take care of themselves. They have <coughs> their pocket money. They have their their you know phones. They have their access. Their you know Opal cards and whatever they need. Mm. And when they can start driving, they start driving. So you've got you've got like a lot of the kids are individual, um, independent. So you've got any number of different types of household structures and and lifestyles that that the um, kids live at home. Um, so parents bringing up children who are by default, that's, that's, that's mission impossible as it is. It's just such a difficult it's task tough, yeah. as it is. And I mean, these days with things becoming so much easier, sometimes you think, is it, is it helpful for parenting or is, does it make parenting worse? Does it mm. make it even more challenging? I mean, is it a good idea to give your child a phone or isn't it a good idea? Yeah. Should you give your child access to... Internet. Any internet or not? Mm. Should he have a credit card? Or I have access to your credit card. You know, should you be, should he be a consumer and know how to get around and from a young age, or should you, you know what I mean? And so, with the million and one different permutations, you get all sorts of kids. Yeah, you get a kid who's independent, but he's arrogant at school. Mm. You get a kid who's like, you know, he's he's such an angel, but step outside the house, he doesn't, he doesn't know, know what's doesn't going on. Yeah, catch can't catch a bus. Yeah, you know what I mean. And you get everything in between. Now, everybody would love to see a child, Tabarakallah, who's like the complete package. <coughs> of course. You know what I mean? But how many of them do you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, everybody's very good at pointing out the kids who've completely lost the plot. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, but look, the parents do have a big responsibility, and it's easy to say. You know, it's put it all on the parents, the parents' responsibility. Um, and it's all their fault when things go wrong and they make mistakes with the kids. If they make mistakes, if the kids err, it's the parents' fault and so on and so forth. But in, unfortunately, you know, in, in, in reality, things are not as, as easy as, as, uh, as they may seem. Now, look, but I would say that the parents, again, do have a responsibility at home. And I, I look, I, I, let me take the conversation in one particular point. Um, I think the psychology of bringing up children is very important. It's not about feeding them and, and clothing them and they have everything that they need materialistic, you know. There's a lot of psychology involved and even that is tricky. Like, how do you discipline your child without losing them? Yeah. You know what I mean? How do you punish your <coughs> child or discipline them and still show them that even though I, it's tough love, I've, I've disciplined you and you're you're upset now. Yeah. But I still love you and I'm doing it for your own good. Yes. Like it's one or the other. That's tough to convince. <laughs> That's tough Absolutely. to get, especially to a young teen. You're either spoiling the kid completely because yeah. you want to shame that you love him, yeah. you love him, and you've completely corrupted him because now he's a big spoiled brat mm. who who can't take two words, he mm. can't handle being wrong ever. Yeah. Or you're completely depriving your kids to the point where they hate your guts and they think that you're an absolute monster. Mm. Right, and, and they can't wait to get out of the house. They now. Can't wait to get out of the house, <laughs> and as soon as they get out of the house, they'll do a, a 180 on you or a 360, yeah. and it's like you've just lost that child, and he's went completely off track. Yeah, you know. Um, but going back to that point, even even if you're going to be a master of you know dealing with your kids in the best in the best possible psychological way, yeah, where you're still friends, they confide in you. You've got an amazing relationship with them, a friendship. You actually hang out. You talk together. You're close, you know. And I'm saying these words, and I, I can see now parents crying, yeah, thinking, "I wish my son was like that. I yeah. wish my daughter was like That's that." That's ideal, of course. As we, you know what yeah. I mean. Um, and then, and then there's the challenge of, what if they come to you, and they're being honest, 
and they talk to you about things they've seen or heard mm. and it's the most abhorrent social <coughs> issue it's the most abhorrent religious issue like outright kufr yeah outright yani the worst possible things that you would see or, or something know massively illegal yeah in in society and they're coming and they're being frank about it and mm. they're telling you and on one hand you feel like you want to rip your hair out or you want to you know like you can't sit still but as if as soon as you do that you've lost your child and on the other hand you can't be completely passive and like it's fine it's okay or you know it's really like you really got to have that kind of discipline to say look i don't want to lose my child but i need to make sure he's aware that this is bad mm. you know now look this this it's a big conversation but the child needs to feel safe the child needs to feel like they matter the child needs to feel like they're welcome the child needs to feel like they can be themselves you know now once you kind of ensure all these impossible things at once yeah <laughs> And you have that relationship with your child, and mate, I tell you, hats off to any parent who's able to do that. Not when the child's in 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 uh, primary school. Oh yeah, once they're a bit older, I say ten plus. Yeah, yeah, once they're once they're teenagers, right? And they've done such a good job with them that they shut down when it comes to haram, when it comes to things that are illegal, when it things things that are like socially unacceptable, and they're not they're that switched on and that discipline that they will stay away from it. You know, hats off to a parent who's able, who's who's managed to do that. How do you think they do it? I mean, that's that's the thing. Look, the best, like like I'm I'm saying, one of the best things you can you can have with a child is to keep them as friends. Yeah. To strike that friendship, you know, and it there, there'll be there'll be a cost for the parent. They'd have to be very disciplined, very very um, uh, um very confident in their position very disciplined to be able to control their nerves mm-hmm. when the child comes to them about this <coughs> kind of information which yani uh, it's completely unacceptable but you can't blow up in the kid's face yeah so when the child has all of this ammunition from home when they have that self confidence from home when they have that level of knowledge that level of trust when they when look most often than not if a child has rapport with an adult mm. and you'd like to think the average adult is reasonable you'd like and to think you'd like to think that i mean we can't get into extremes and say no, no there's a corrupt not. parent <coughs> teaching their child corruption yeah there's an irresponsible parent that teaches their kids about everything irresponsible yeah. like we're just talking about fitra yeah for example like you'd like to think that parents at least they'd be telling their kids about things that are socially acceptable, socially unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd be very telling basic them things is wrong like, and That's right. Very basic rude, things about... Things like that. Basic things also about halal and haram yeah. in the din. So, as long as you've got a child who has rapport with a parent like that, who can confide in them, who can talk to them about these things, and they're getting these messages, this advice from a parent... Mm. It could be an uncle, it could be a teacher, it could be somebody they, they respect and look up to and confide in and trust. You know, <coughs> if if they have that and it gives them that confidence, it gives them that guidance, that's a that's a, a, a youth who is more able to withstand this pressure. Yeah. Who who is better equipped against the challenges of this kind of pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, as opposed to like a, a child who's completely a leaf in the wind, mm-hmm. and these kind of pressures take him left and right and up and down, and they're just, you know, the pressure says jump, and they say how high. Yeah. You know, so going back to the question of the household, you know, it's look, it's a big melting pot of so many things that the child should be receiving, has to be, you know, uh come in learning at home. Mm-hmm. Um. But as long as long as they have, you know, they have that rapport with a parent who's giving them a lot of what they seek in this pressure: attention, value, significance, love. You know, uh, a place to belong, something exciting, uh, an occupation of some sort, like a mental occupation. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, something to to keep themselves busy with, something to <coughs> occupy, an occupation, something to keep occupied with. Definitely, the more that's provided at home, you know, the more they won't need it outside of the home in these environments, mm. you know. And like you said, perhaps as you said, I mean, when when you when you 
long for something that you don't have, you will go seek it elsewhere. Yeah. And and consciously and subconsciously, these kids, they're smart. They know if they can find something at home or not. Yeah. If they want someone to listen to, they'll tell you, there's nobody at home who's willing to listen to me. Mm. No one's got the time for me. No one's interested in what I have to say. And they think what I have to say is stupid. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell my friends about it. You know, or I'll tell so-and-so, this person, that person. You know, and this poor girl who gets attention from some random bloke. Yeah. And he's a dropkick. Yeah. She says, well, he's... He's, he's the only one giving me attention. That's right. Yeah. I'm getting more attention from him than my parents. <coughs> You know, and, and my brother's a similar age and the only thing my brother can say to me are F words and this, that, yeah. and you know, and it's always a fight and, and I hate his guts and I don't like being at home, for example. Yeah. Any that, those those circumstances exist. And in, in an ideal world, in a perfect world, if those things were given to that person, then they wouldn't be looking for that specific thing. Yeah. You know, so. Definitely a lot of, uh, a lot, lot to take in for for parents or potential parents out there <coughs> that are listening and um, viewing, if they are viewing. I guess in the 12 years plus that you've been involved in the in the industry, have you seen much uh, of a drastic change or have you seen improvements or things get worse in your opinion? I mean, when, when it comes to this sort of thing though, has you seen, I mean, you were talking about now more recently, there has been an avalanche of you know, like social media and all this sort of thing. So I guess naturally there, there is going to be a bit more pressure, we can say. But, I mean, in saying that, me personally, what I've seen is I think lately, what I've seen is the two extremes just distance themselves apart. Like I've seen good kids, you know, the good kids before, right? A good kid now is a super good kid. I mean, it's, there was only a couple of handful of kids I remember back, you know, a while ago where a guy was getting in a 90 plus in his UAI or ATAR, whatever it's called now. You're so old. <laughs> you can't keep up. <laughs> can't keep up. And um, nowadays, it's like there's this huge amount of, of uh, you know, Muslim kids in that community that are doing so well. It's like this was non existent before. Yeah. But then there's the other side of the coin where it's like, Maybe there were bad kids back in the day, but now there's a lot of bad kids. Like people are always talking about this this generation coming up and all the youth and how a lot of the bad stuff they're involved in. It's like, well, there's also a lot more bad kids now, and they're they're involved in. You know, I've heard of some some high criminal activity from kids that are you know 15 and 16. So it's like, you know, on one one side of the coin, yeah, things are. I guess from what I see getting better because academically there's some really fantastic results some really big yeah. things to be I'm proud really, of yeah. from what we see absolutely um, really but then on the other side of the coin it's like oh you know but this is happening also I mean in the 12 years plus you've had what do you think I mean have you seen much has it stayed balanced do you see more positives coming you know is there light at the end of the tunnel so to say um, what do we I mean what do future parents have you know, to look forward to, or what do they, you know, probably need to be worried about? I mean, considering yourself, you are a parent as well of, um, you know, kids that are growing, getting into high school and all that sort of thing. What are you, what are your concerns and what are, you, what are your things that you're looking forward to, I guess? Hello, look, um, look, as you said, alhamdulillah, it's not all doom and gloom, you know, but uh, I'm sure parents, all parents would be hoping that, um, their kids are on the kind of rosy side of yeah. rosy side of things, you know, because you know people worry about life in Australia in a Western country. People worry about um, my child's going to go to university. Um, people worry about the internet. Mm. With each one of these things, if you want it, if you want the good, you'll find it. Mm. If you want the bad, you'll find it. You know what I mean? So it, whether it's at university or whether it's on the internet, like every known popular sheikh, for example, has a YouTube channel has YouTube videos at university. There's a musallah. There's a, you know, there's lessons there. Yeah. You know, so even like even at un even at the school as well, and even among society, you get the barakallah. These kids who are graduating with amazing results and lifting the the head of the the community and yeah. with their results and with their outstanding marks, 
attending university, doing very, very well. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And well, lately a there's been a huge... Absolutely. I guess the last five years, it's been unbelievable. And I say there's uh, yani, uh, credit goes <coughs> to those individual teachers and those specific yani, oh, institutions yeah. who are working hard during school hours and after school hours, you know, um, who are working on this and making this possible, facilitating mm. for it. And of course, because the, the child came in, he... he it has to be within the child. The fire has to burn within the child mm. to, to reach those heights. And when you get individuals <coughs> facilitating that, supporting that, accelerating that, helping that, making that happen, and then you get this, you know, it's a union of all these efforts, creating this outstanding result for this child, and then, inshallah, them going on to bigger and better things. But, uh, yeah, it's really disappointing that also within the society, within a school, even within a university setting, whatever setting, People they just they just seek the bad. Mm. They seek the evil. They look for it. They seek it, you know. And um, one hand doesn't clap. Like the, people are uh, uh, joining efforts. People are uh, cooperating on the battle. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and they're putting effort into it. And they're planning. And they're plotting. And they're consciously. It's not like a spontaneous thing. They're consciously. This is this becomes their culture, their habit, their lifestyle. And it just goes from bad to worse, you know. So, yani, uh, the hope for the parents is that, inshallah, if your children they seek the good, they're not going to affect it by the bad. Mm. But if they seek the bad, they will find it. Of course, you know. And subhanallah, <coughs> you see, you see kids who are always inclined to good. Allah my barik, yani, I've I've known kids from your kindergarten, and now you they're like in year eleven, mm. and Allah my barik, like the tathbeet from Allah, they're still on the straight and narrow. You know, and you know what's what's the secret behind a child like that? Their parents are behind them. Yeah, their parents are with them. There's a lot of support. Absolutely, Allah A lot of yeah. good morals instilled. Absolutely, and all that you sort just of thing. you just look at a child like that and you go, you know, I I have a saying for con- for kids like that. I say this child is an answered dua. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, like there's no other explanation. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's the father made dua, the father's father made dua, or something, yeah. and Allah answered the prayer through this individual child, mm. and he's like. He or she are like a star. Everywhere they go, everybody mm. just you just say the name. And then there are other kids that, subhanAllah, no matter what you do, no matter what you threaten them with, it's like they're always inclined to the wrong thing, mm. you know? And uh, uh, you, t- you try different things, you speak to them, you try different strategies. But subhanAllah, yani, unless they sit down with themselves and they make a conscious decision to change, to change their environment, to change their habits... Uh, to get a fresh look on things, you know, to try and understand why something is not allowed, why something is illegal, why something is haram, and get themselves with the right crowd, discipline themselves. Yani, <laughs> you need to want to change. <coughs> you need to want to make that that change yourself. Yani, Jibreel alayhi salam is not going to come down with another message. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get a special exclusive invite from Jibreel alayhi salam and receive wahi to change you need to change within yourself Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the faculties to look to listen you know to hear to understand to process that information you know have you had any success with uh, some of the young boys you've probably dealt with at, at the school look I tell you man you uh, in terms of the troubled ones there's a lot a lot of success comes from positive reinforcement and mm. positive attention <coughs> You know, positive reinforcement and positive attention. The worst thing you can do is write off a child as hard as it is. Yeah. So sometimes almost impossible. Like we know the story of, of the bloke who was giving his friend, dawah to his friend. Come to the prayer, come to the prayer. Come to salah, come to fasting, zakat, this, that. Until the bloke said, no, leave me alone. Yeah. He goes, you're never going to enter Jannah. He wrote him off, khalas. Mm. And then as a punishment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the one who made that accusation or that curse was put in the hellfire and the other one was put into Jannah. Yeah. Like, who, who are you to make a statement <coughs> like that? Who, mm. do you, who are you to write someone off and yeah. say, this person's going to Jahannam. This person's in the hellfire. You've written them off. It doesn't give you the license. Yeah. So as impossible as it is and as difficult as it is, going mm. back to the discipline of someone who's in authority or someone who's, who's an influencer, the discipline not to write somebody off to keep giving them dawah, giving that positive attention. Like, you know someone's a criminal. You know it. Yeah. You've seen them do yeah. stuff. You've heard stuff about them. 
but you have no idea how much of a big difference it does when you give them that positive reinforcement and tell them you're good, tell them you're great, tell mm. them, I like to see you, your beautiful smile, I like when you're here, you're smart. You're a smart kid, Yanni, that was a good deed, it comes from, Yanni, you give them that hope, you know, try and reignite, again, that fitrah and that iman, yeah. you know, um, and <coughs> even even though they may, um, Yanni, for a long time, not come onto the straight path, but but those positive messages will stay with that child, mm. and maybe one day, time after time, it's enough. It's enough for a, 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 like a child who's always caught up with the wrong thing to have trust and feel like they can talk to a sheikh, yeah, or a dai who doesn't look down at them, mm. who hasn't written them off. Who oh, I can't talk to this person. He thinks I'm a kafir. He thinks I'm finished. Yeah. yeah, I can't talk to this guy. He'll he'll spit in my face. <coughs> and unfortunately, a lot of the times, this is why a lot of these kids they don't get to the masjid because yeah. they feel like they're, they're going to get judged. Yeah, they're definitely scared. And look, get get this point, brother Noor. When you see a brother who has the most shocking hairstyle, tattered from head <laughs> to toe, come to the masjid. That's when you know you're doing the right thing. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> when I'm happiest. That's it's when like, you know wow, whatever is, we're this doing is what I want. Yeah, <laughs> whatever we're doing, it's right. Yeah. If people like that are coming into the masjid, that's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's it. No, no, they're gonna judge me on my hair. They're gonna judge me on my tats. Unfortunately, that's what we're hearing. And yeah. I know some of these boys know that I do drugs. I know some of these boys know that I, you know, I'm with girls. Mm. No, it's too shameful. You know for what me. I found though? I found that it, sometimes it is an excuse because it's well, you hear it. But it's not the case. And that if, if a lot of those people that were like that, so, you know, with a funny haircut or, you know, if, if they've uh, made a mistake in the past of, of getting a tattoo or dressing a certain way and they keep thinking about entering a mosque, it's like, oh, if I go like this now, uh, you know, people are going to judge me. This is what's going to happen. I heard about this guy. I heard about that guy. It's kind of like, you know, they themselves are just creating an excuse. Whereas if they actually went in there, they they're probably the person that all the good attention would go to, and everyone would probably be most happy to see walk into the building. Subhanallah. So yeah. Yeah. Allah <sighs> with uh, with the use. Um, moving along, we're talking about um, the role of parents. No. And. Um, I was asking you about the, the the twelve years, or so that you've had in there. Oh, well. Did you say you think that it's gotten better? Look, it's it's hard to say. You if you had to look, even, come to the crunch. Look, even if everything was doom and gloom, right? Yeah, <coughs> Rasulullah he says, "La yizal al khairu fi ummati ila qiyam al-saa." So th- that goodness, those good kids will always be there. Yeah. Those good parent parents will always be there. Those institutions for good will always be there, inshallah. You know, the ummah will never be deprived of that. And if you think about it on a, on a high level, Akhnur, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He insists mm. in the Quran. Nurihi, walau karihal kafirun, or, walau karihal mushrikun, or as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah insists on continuing His light, mm. even if there are enemies to this light, even if there are plotters and planners to this light who are trying to extinguish it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue his nur through people, you know, through institutions, mm. through masajid, through centers, through individuals, you know, be they male or female, and if through students of knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala channels this nur through people. It's not through Jibreel alayhi salam, it's, it's through what's happening on a day-to-day basis. So that nur will continue to exist, inshallah. And we hope that our children will be part of that campaign, mm. you know, and we hope that we're part of that campaign. You know, and we hope that we we we're connected to that nur that will continue on the day of judgment, and we're included in that roster, in that uh, hall of fame. You know, uh, of of people whom Allah is continuing His light through. Um, and look, looking at how, let's say for example, the Arabic language, which is the the vessel for the Quran. Yeah. You know the the <coughs> Quran is is studied through the Arabic language, and there's this obviously strong link between the Quran and Arabic. Look at how Arabic was taught in the past, look at how it's taught now. Mm. You know? 
look at the number of institutions that existed before and look at the number of institutions that exist today. Yeah. You know, some people do complain that there's a lot of, too many Islamic schools, for example. But listen, if they're all teaching Islam, they're all teaching Arabic, mm. there's, there's no problem with that. Do you think there's enough focus in the schools? I mean, I hear a lot. I'm sorry to keep sounding so negative. It's not me. Uh, why, it's, it's, why you know not, what I mean? Why? It's just um, I'm voicing what what I hear, and, and you know, no, I, no. I other people want to want to you know dive deeper. They want to hear the hear the truth. Uh, that was one of the reasons w- I set up this podcast was that I wanted to tackle you know potentially controversial things. I wanted to get to the crux of of problems. I wanted to speak about things that maybe people don't normally talk about on the member, but they generally do talk about it. You know, while right. they're sitting down in a group under the minbar. So a lot of people say that, hey, look, yeah, there's all these Islamic schools and what have you, but it's a money-making scheme. <laughs> and they're not teaching Islam. <laughs> you know, go to an Islamic school and you won't see Islam. It's all about marks. It's all about money. Um, yeah, they might have a bit of segregation here and there, but um, where's the morals? Where's the values? If I send, I mean, I remember speaking to a parent <coughs> and he was saying, I'm going to send my son to school xyz and i was like look you know not to be mr preacher you know as as i might be known to be but you you know why don't you send him to an islamic school like no you know he's going to get better better morals here that that school for example you know the one you're telling telling me to send my son all they care about is putting you know super duper pressure and uh getting the fees from me Hmm. so what i mean what 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 would you say in response to say a parent like that that's sitting there going, oh, yeah, there's all these Islamic schools, whatever. But, I mean, you look at the streets, where's the Islam then? Where's the where's the focus in these Islamic schools, if no. if anything? Where's the values and the morals of Islam that, that we hear about, you know, being respectful to the oldies, um, being someone that's generous, you know, caring about society, um, <clears throat> looking after the young, looking after the old, you know, please, thank yous, all, all you know, all the good that we hear. No, if there's all these Islamic schools around, and they're meant to be instilling the the Islamic morals and values, how come there's a, a lack of it no. in, within the youth then? No, um, you don't have to go to school on Monday morning. Uh, have to go to work, now, don't you? Yeah, you gonna cost me my job or what? Oopsie. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, I've got three days off for Eid Lata, so <coughs> Alhamdulillah. That's <laughs> the benefit of going to an Islamic school, right? <laughs> But look, I, I can say a number of things. I'm not going to talk on behalf of all no, these things. No, of course schools, not. No, no. You know, and I want to keep my job as well. But apart from that, I can tell you a number of things. Um, <coughs> first of all, uh, sometimes parents expect too much from a school, you know. And there's often a complaint that you can't just send your kids to an Islamic school and expect them to do all the tarbiyah for yeah, you. hundred percent. And you can't send the kid to the school and expect that when he's done, all of a sudden he's like completely changed revolutionary. Mm. Um, there are many success stories where a student of an Islamic school wants to wear the hijab even though her mother doesn't. Mm. And her mother's fine with that. Um, there are many circumstances where the child hears and learns that for example, smoking is haram and they believe in it even though their parents smoke. You know, so sometimes what the kids learn at the school and the life that they live is different. Now, so parents have to adjust their expectations of what can a school possibly give. Or, uh, yani, <coughs> it's it's enough that you get so many benefits from an Islamic school that you will never get in a public school. Mm. You have the virtue of having, usually, not all the time, um, many times, most teachers in hijab. Yeah. Even though there are Islamic schools with teachers without hijab. Yeah. Yes. That's no, right. Um, the salah is a common thing. Yeah. It's a normal thing it's every day. It's a huge day. positive there, yeah. Absolutely. The celebration of Ramadan. You have the iftars. You have salat al-jumu'ah. You have the big deal about Aid, mm. you know, like these are things you never get in a public school, mm. you know. And if you get them in a private school, that's a big deal, you know. Like, like to have some sort of Islamic environment is a big deal. At the end of the day, if that's it's got no value to you, and you still rather put them in a public school, that's that's your decision, mm. you know. <coughs> or, or by then, look, 
depends if the kids are brought up in a particular way and they see that reinforced at the school, mm. then that's that what they experience at the school is a reinforcement of what they learn at home. Mm. But can anybody quote that an Islamic school is teaching kids the wrong things? No, of course not. Are they teaching them something that is haram? No, no. You know I'll never mean? get that. Yeah, that's, that's, good. that's a good point. But then the other thing is this, uh, Akhi Noor. Like sometimes when you ask, what are the kids like in this school? Mm. You're like, what do you think they're going to be? They're a product of the community. Mm. You're not getting kids from, from Mars. Yeah. <laughs> like tell me, tell me what the kids <coughs> like in the society. And they have a sample of these kids. Yeah. You know? Hello, yes. You know, there's, there's uh, you know, talk of schools filtering out kids with bad marks. You know, so they yeah, give the academic that a lot, yeah. You know, all schools try and filter out kids who, who, who don't conform, don't behave. You know, there, there was no school, even public school, wants a kid who's always damaging school property, mm. getting into a fight, being disrespectful to, st- to students and staff, causing a menace, um, truanting. You know, all these, nobody accepts those things. Mm. You know, and, and uh, no school likes to have students like that. You know, or we, if they have students like that, they have special programs for them to keep them at the school and, and, and whatnot. But that's that's a big conversation. But the population in a school is is a reflection of, of the society. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like within the society, you've got the good kids. Within the society, you have the troubled kids. Mm. All of these kids of the community, they're <coughs> at a school somewhere. You know? So it depends. What What do you expect out of the school? What do you expect the school to be doing? Do you think the expectation's you know? too high from parents? Look, um, sometimes expectation is too high, or sometimes they expect something that doesn't exist. Mm. Sometimes they assume, you know, if they promise something and it's not delivered, that's another. That's situation. fair enough. Yeah. That's a, like you promised me. I enrolled my kids in this school <coughs> on this basis, and that's not happening. Mm. You know, therefore I'm going to pull them out, or I'm not happy. That's a different story. You know, but um, and then you get parents that are that are satisfied because they see the benefit as opposed to being in a public school. You know, and there, yani, if you look at the many, come in at the same time, Akhinur, like we have to factor in that we're in a Western society, we're in Australia, mm. you know. And I used to think that it was an amazing thing that even through the government, you can give kids in a random public school half an hour of scripture. Yeah, that is actually amazing. Like, you know, any kid in a random public school is entitled to half an hour of scripture. And a uh, big shout out to the brothers and sisters at yeah, ISRE May Allah reward you who guys. are running that. You know, um, that's in and of itself, that's an amazing thing. Mm. Even if it's half an hour. Quite in a blessed to have school, that, I think, yeah. You know what I mean? It, <coughs> we all wish it was more. Of we course. have it every day. But let's, but let's be happy with what we got yeah, at the very least. Yeah, but my response yeah. reward them, the first thing they'll tell you is that their resources are really stretched. Mm. They'd have like any number of co- schools who have enough kids, but just they don't have teachers. They don't have the... They're always reaching out. <coughs> you know, yeah, to, to a teacher yeah. to come just volunteer. We, we give you everything. We'll give you everything. Just go into that school for half an hour mm. and give this content. And Jazakallah khair. They even get to pick their day. Is that right? Or That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I've, I've heard of stories of people going out of their way, catching buses and, and trains and whatnot, just to get to that school, to deliver to these kids the half an hour and then catch the train and the bus all the way back to their homes just to know that I've done my fair share this half an hour this week. Yeah. You know, so let alone an Islamic school. You know, where they they start the day with Quran mm. and Tasbih and they have Salat al-Dhuhr every day in Jama'ah mm. and they take time off for Eid, you know, and they celebrate Ramadan and they have Iftar at night and Taraweeh in, in, in the school, mm. you know, and it's okay to be Muslim and it's okay to, and, and you know, the canteen sells halal food <coughs> and they reinforce, look, every school reinforces segregation. Yeah. There is no school, Islamic school, no matter how bad you think it is, it says it's okay for boys and girls you need to, to hook up and to hold hands and kiss and hang out and mm. whatnot and all the other stuff some of the kids get up to. So you need to be come in realistic. Yeah. You need, so are you saying that the school is <coughs> okay with this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So would you go up to the principal and say, the teacher let these two meet up and they thought it was okay and they encouraged them to? Yeah, parents went, no way. You know what I mean? Like sometimes the parents themselves know that they slip up. There's mm. a lot of stuff they don't know. Some some things are difficult. <coughs> I mean, I don't know. Unless you're running, running good boot camp at home mm. and you you, know, you run your house like it's the military, <coughs> a lot of stuff goes under the radar. Yeah, it is. And you're talking about human beings. And you know, your teacher's got a job to do. Supervisors have a job to do, yes. But they will not see everything. Mm. The cameras will not keep, you know, they will not pick up everything. Mm. 
Especially that a lot of the times, Akhinur, unfortunately, it's a catch-22 because parents expect so much out of out of um, the school. But when they arm them with a phone that's connected to the internet, mm. like, are you aware of what your child is getting up to after hours? Or if they've got their phone on school grounds, what they're doing with their phone? Mm. Like, don't worry about them seeing the girl on school grounds, whether it's a private school or a public school. What are they doing after school hours? What are they doing overnight with their phone? Yeah. You know, like you can, you can, you can meet and build a relationship, and pretty much everything online through social media oh, before definitely. you even consider meeting up. Yeah, you know. So, if parents are willy nilly giving arming their children with these phones and this internet, and then you're saying, "Oh, what's the school doing?" Habib, your son and daughter, do you know what they're getting up to on their phones in your own house mm. to begin with? Just as an example, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, let's put things into perspective. They will segregate classes. They will monitor kids' behavior. They have surveillance cameras. They will hold them up if anything comes up. You know, they, they will play their role. But each one of us come in has a responsibility. I'm, I'm not saying the school doesn't have a responsibility. It does. But... I mean, as a customer, as a paying customer, uh, parents have a right to complain. Yeah. And they have a right to withdraw their kids if they don't have trust in the board, they don't <coughs> have trust in the uh, in the staff, they don't mm. have a trust in the vision of the school. That's their prerogative. That's mm. their decision. And if they really think that the kid's better off in a public system, I mean, you know, they, they, they have a right to do they're whatever they want. That, they're yeah. entitled to that. Mm. That's fair enough. I guess um, look to, to shed some light on that, you know, me personally, I believe, I think just, in general, people like to complain. Yeah, <laughs> parents are you know they're just never happy, especially when it comes to their kids. And you I think that's like why. That, yeah, that's why we probably see a lot of this. Um, I think a lot of people say the millennials or this new generation they feel so entitled. Absolutely. And it's like, <clears throat> obviously, not saying they're all like that, but that probably stems back from the parents giving them everything they want and complaining about everything if it's not perfect for them. Yeah. You know, so that's just maybe the new generation or the new wave of. Of maybe this Gen X or Gen Y parents, how they've become, you know, they're just so used to, you know, having a high standard with things that they just want to complain about everything, maybe. So yeah. that's the way I see it. They just, but I, then they should understand it's just it's never going to be perfect anywhere. So. Yeah, and look, the last the last comment I want to make, you know, about generally about schooling and private schools and whatnot, is that at the end of the day, even though it's a quote unquote, unquote Islamic school, yeah, they're governed by policies. Yeah. They're governed by regulations. There are legalities, right? Like everybody knows about the big dramas that happen with like a major Islamic yeah, school. Yeah. Cutting the funding and whatnot yeah. and the oh, disaster. Huge like huge disaster. You know, I'm not worried about the school. I'm worried about these year 12 kids <coughs> and year 11 kids and mm. their parents and them being stranded at such a sensitive time in yeah. the year. You know, that's the last thing they were, they were even anticipating, you know, at least for the kids' sake. And then you've got the staff who are like that's how they and they're living from 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 this institution right so there are laws that we need to follow there mm. are regulations so mm. let's not kid ourselves that this is an islamic school like you've got some sort of islamic uh any country or, or state yeah. or something like that that's, that's, unfortunately that's you what need they expect, to be yeah. yeah you need to be compliant at every turn yeah you know there are regular inspections to make sure that you are following the rules mm. you can't just you know just do whatever you want and and run things as you wish you know, there are serious compliance matters that without them you would have nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you you need that bear you need to bear that in mind when you're running you know, even when you're running a business, let alone a school. Mm. You know? So these things also have an impact on how a school is run. So All right, well look, we are coming towards the end of um of the show. Uh, unfortunately it's been a great discussion. Um what I do like to end with, and I started this from the last episode, and hopefully I can continue it every single episode, inshallah, is uh, some parting advice. Looks like our discussion has taken us, you know, to uh, talk about the youth, a couple of parenting uh, avenues, uh, what it's like being a parent, etc. What would you suggest, uh, based on what we've spoken about, you know, what are some parting advices you'd want to give? to you know all the parents that could be listening or maybe listening at the moment uh, all the people that could be potential parents inshallah in the future and if there are any youth out there that are listening or that will listen uh, in the future what are some things what are some points that you might want to direct towards them 
in regards to you know the the discussion we've had today you know with all the the mental pressure uh, the acceptance at home the almost impossible balance of 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 being you know firm here and disciplinary here right. but also being you know um loving and, and caring so to speak look <coughs> the advice that i would give as as tricky as it is i think yani you know, all parents would benefit from being their child's best friend it's not easy mm. it's not like you just uh you know will it just at the wave uh, the toss of a hat you can do that but that that would be ideal um especially young parents if you can keep your friends keep your uh children close um and you create an environment for them where they can talk to you they can chat about things um as sometimes <coughs> as intolerable as some conversations might be or some circumstances might be you're better off your child telling you mm. than not telling you so for the sake of you know sometimes some things you can't handle and a wife will say look my husband if he heard this he would just <laughs> go off his head you know they'll they'll be like a disaster world yeah, war yeah, 3 yeah, if, yeah. if this topic was ever discussed or if my kids ever mentioned this to to him you know and i'm talking as a father here right yeah. so um as difficult as it is if your friend your kids can be your best friends or if you can be the best friends to your kids that's ideal but you do you would have to stomach a lot mm. you would have to with um any you know, put up with a lot you'd have to hear a lot you'd have to discipline yourself to take in and like control your nerves um because we know that it can be a very nasty world out there mm. and the kind of things that the kids can be exposed to and things are probably getting worse in terms of access and and what they can uh, you know get a hold <coughs> of and what they can be exposed to um my advice with my limited knowledge and my limited experience is that if you can keep your kids close like that where they can talk to you you're better off hearing that stuff as much as you hate it you're better off hearing it than not hearing it yeah you're better off your child coming to you <coughs> than going to who knows who or at least if you know that your child confides in someone that you know mm. then at least that's you know half a problem ideally if they can confide in you that would be the best but um and the other point that I would like to make is something that really really hurts and something that I find very very painful and I I know that a lot of mothers would be feeling the same pain is that I would strongly urge and recommend that the fathers have a relationship with their children. Mm. Uh unfortunately may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them continued health and prosperity but they are so occupied breadwinning mm. that some of them have no relationship whatsoever with their children. And uh may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to give them strength and health and they're doing a fantastic job with their households and their basically funding the lifestyle yeah. that all these wives and children have buying yeah. whatever they want yeah. and living the life that they want it's all it's all basically back on on you know it's on the backs of the fathers mm. or those mothers that are working hard but <coughs> as hard as any you know, as much as possible if those fathers can build that relationship with their children um i mean you you get you get kids who say they never see their fathers even yeah. though they're at home they don't get they hardly get any emotions mm. any affection hugs kisses and that's where the looking elsewhere comes you, in you know that's that's that creates in a scenario for mm. that you know and like i'm not a i'm not a, um, a psychology expert but by any measure you know but um like when you get that affection when the female daughter gets an affection from the male father as an older father as a as like a father figure mm you know when when the son gets that soft tenderness from the mother that's part of any you know, the complete psychology of the human yeah you know what i mean like so that that attention they get from a father is not like the attention they get from a mother the authority they see in a father the influence they see in a father the validity they see from a father it's mm. not like the validity from a mother you know the approval that they see from the father the worth and the value they see from a father the attention they get from a father is not like the attention they get from the mother and i can i can hear a lot of mothers kind of just making dua and begging you know for for them to see that from a father towards yeah. the children 
<coughs> but just things they just get in the way, you know, work, commitments. Sometimes it's the boys. Sometimes it's whatever. Sometimes you know, the last thing uh, the father wants after a long day at work is just, he was just wants to eat and rest and just chill. Yeah, if it's, um, it gets you tough know, out there. That's mm. right. You know, just spend a bit of time on TV, probably falls asleep watching TV, mm. and just goes to bed and it's back again. You know, and we can't be too hard on the fathers. I mean, because they're sustaining the lives of all these kids that's that we right. see and all that's the wives. Right. You can't have a swipe at your your husband for being so occupied with work when you're driving the AMG and your kids are in Nikes and they're in mm. brand new Eid clothes. From and they're getting whatever they want. Yeah, yeah and they're it's all they're, each one of them's got their gadget with five gigs <coughs> in their in their iPads. He's making sure they're happy. He's you know doing what, what he's got to do. Yeah. Absolutely, and he feels this is my this is my role. This is my role. Yeah, this that's is right. this is and as and. and <coughs> And I feel like I'm being a husband and a father if mm. my my family has everything they need. Mm. The cars they drive, the house they live in, the clothes they wear. My family is set. I'm doing my job. That's great. That's fantastic. You know, I'll reward you. But what I'm saying is that in the process, make sure you've got some sort of relationship with your kids. Mm. Spend time with them. And also, on, on a side note as well, usually kids, they come as a package. You spend time with all of them or none of them. Yeah. But uh, one small piece of advice, a uh, <coughs> whisper of advice I'd give both mothers and fathers, if they can try, which is something which is even trickier, uh-huh. if you can try spending individual time with each one of your kids mm. individually, like get to know them. Oh, that's gold. Get to know them yeah. individually. Like what's your little son like when he's on his own? Mm. What's your little daughter like when they're on their own? Have you spent time with your eldest son one-on-one? Have you spent time with your eldest daughter one-on-one? You know, that's almost impossible to do mm. you know but there's a lot of benefit if you build that rapport with each one of your individual children they're usually together <coughs> and they're usually occupied or they're usually bickering because they're, they're together but you will find that you know, I'm sure maybe there's a lot of fathers a lot of mothers if they're spending individual time with one particular child the youngest one or the middle one or whatever they'll find like this feels <coughs> weird I've, I've never been with this child by themselves yeah. It's always been together. And especially if you've got limited time, like a father. You know, limited time. It says all the kids at once or none of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He's doing the hard yakka, so it's got it's gotta make it happen. And look, there's there's a cup inside a child that will never be filled except from a parent. Yeah. 100%. There's a cup inside the child. The only one who can fill that cup is a parent. Mm. You know, so just make sure that that cup is full as much as possible, a half full, three quarters full. Mm you know, a third or a quarter full and just not completely empty, you know, because they'll seek to fill it from someone else and somewhere else and it just, it just won't do the job. Mm. Like we know people, like people you see in movies, you see in TV shows, you see it come in in people that all their lives, people are looking for validity that their parents didn't give them and they'll never find it, mm. you know, and they'll always tell you that they they feel pain because of something their mother did or their father did. Mm. And it's just, it's never been the same since. And it's always been a problem for them forever. And they will never feel 100% until they get it. And they keep seeking it unless they come to terms with it themselves and just deal with it or somehow try and and manage how they feel about it. Mm. You know, um, it'll continue to to bug them. Mm. And as a parent, you have that responsibility to make sure that your kids are getting that from you. Yeah. You know, that they feel like you exist like they exist in your world and they're important and they they matter and that helps a lot in 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 ways that aren't necessarily visible. Like you might find that your child still ignores you, still doesn't listen to you, but in the back of the mind that that exists, that's there, mm. and they'll notice it when they know that one of their peers doesn't have a father anymore or doesn't have a mother anymore, or that they're separated, or that there's AVOs and court cases and, mm. and divorce issues well these days that's that's something become a lot more prominent this uh i mean divorce is fine we know that but i think it's the ugly divorces that are having absolutely. a huge effect absolutely so yeah and at the end of the day you know they'll tell you the biggest victim is the children yeah 100 percent. avios and the children crazy. yeah yeah <laughs> so i mean that's uh that's my contribution there with my limited knowledge there, Nora. I, I, I don't look... What about any of the young chaps? Look, I, I I make a disclaimer. I'm not a parenting expert. You're not? No, no. But <laughs> as they say in Lebanese, I, I hatched out of the egg yesterday. But, you know, there's just points that you just, you know, mention and maybe it'll strike a chord with somebody and it, f- someone finds it 
Hill for uh, thanks for that. Ninety nine percent of what you said was rubbish, but this one percent is good. I'll yeah. take that. Well, yeah, we'll take it. Why not? Why not? Well, look, look. The whole reason I think the, it was it was good the way the discussion went. Anyway, was I think uh, quite ideal considering the experience you've got. I know you're a father of um, more than a f- you know few kids. Four, Four you got. Mm. Tabarakallah. May Allah protect them all and bless them. And and three step kids as well. Yeah. So. You know, and you've been a teacher for so, so long, and I've seen you teach. So, I knew that uh, talking about youth and parenting and all this sort of thing would might have been quite ideal for no, I mean, for someone like yourself. And a lot of respect goes out to the um, the real parents, you know, who have been parents for years and mm. years, and have parents of a lot of kids. We don't mean to, you know, step uh, over onto their no, turf. Of course we, not. We can't no, compete with the, the real parents out there who have done an amazing job in the community. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, what about the youth? If 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 uh, we got a young guy, I wanted to tuned in here and listen to everything we were talking about, and said, "Man, what are these two old old blokes on about? I'm this, I'm that." Look, speaking of the youth, oh. I I promised uh, <coughs> some of the boys like Brahim and Rashid and and Adam and Bilal to kind of give them a shout out. I'm not <laughs> going to mention their last names because they know who they are, and um, they they refuse to be sheep. They want to be leaders. They know what I'm talking about. But um, advice to the youth. Um, look, wh- I feel like one of the easiest <coughs> ways that uh, the kids may go off course is by hanging around the wrong people. Yeah. Um, and when they hang around the wrong people, they start to sympathize with them. And they start to understand why they do things in a bad way. So that when they get in trouble they kind of justify what they've did mm. because they, they saw the whole process and they know why they did it. And they forget that at the end of the day what they've done is wrong mm. and what they continue to do is wrong. But then they become you know, just with them through and through and they just start living their lifestyle and, and they know, they're intelligent to know enough to know how to fit in, what to say and what to do to become part of that group and to belong to that group and all of a sudden they become one of them. You know, so... I guess a, and a simple advice I can give them is just know who you're hanging around mm. and who you're making <coughs> your friends. You know, and look, one of the things that is frustrating with the youth is that um, sometimes they don't understand that they can choose their own identity. They can choose it. They can choose who they want to be. Like sometimes if, if you say a fancy word to somebody who say, no, I don't use that word. Why? It's just the word. Just use it. Yeah. Why do you not use that word? Because it's it's if it's expressive and <coughs> elaborative and it helps you express yourself. I mean, why do you speak full stop? Mm. You speak so people can understand you. You know, so if you consciously decide to choose that I'm going to speak like this, you chose that yourself. Yeah. For example, I chose to dress like this. Mm. You can dress, you can <coughs> choose how to dress as you wish. But when you decide for yourself you're going to live a particular way. You're going to speak a particular way, dress a particular way. You've made that decision yourself. It's frustrating because you can dress better. You can talk better. Mm. You can eat better. You can live a better lifestyle. You have the power to do all of this and then they choose something which is less than ideal. And they say, then they say, this is me. Who said this is, you said this is me. Mm. You know, you can choose whoever, you can choose who me is, you know. And it's 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 in your hands, but Subhanallah, yani, when they don't think um, uh, yani, enough about these things, and they don't they don't choose the best. And Islam is about choosing the best, being the best, mm. best human being. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent us the best book with the best messenger. You know, He gave us the best deen. The the deen is perfect. Mm. He wants us to be the perfect <coughs> specimen of humankind. Mm. When you choose less for yourself, you know, for, for someone involved in dawah, that's so frustrating. It is, 100%. You know, like, why do you choose? Why are you ripping yourself off? Mm. You could choose the best of character. You could choose the best of behavior. And you're consciously choosing uh, what is less. Mm. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the Quran, when he, he said to the people of Israel, um, what was the verse? Uh, when they, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave them 
من ان سلوى ان انه يوند فمها وعدسها وبصلها التستبدلون الذي ادنى بالذي هو خير لايك ار يو ريبليسينج ذات ويتش از انفيريا يعني يو جيتينج سمثينج ويتش از سوبيريا اند ريبليسينج ويت ذات ويتش از انفيريا يو نو لايك يو كان جيت ذات اني واي يو جيتينج ذا بيست اوف ذا بيست فروم اسلام فروم ذا شريعه فروم ذا دين فروم ذا قران يو نو اند يو تشوزينج فور يور سيلف اند ذير از ذس like lock in your head that that's not me mm. who said that's not you you know so if someone thinks about that hard enough you know you think and you would like to think it's logical but unfortunately it's not that straightforward no, it's not, not that black and white of course not. you know but for them to know that you have you have the power to choose who you want to be and you know in your fitra and you know from your parents tarbiya what the better thing to do is so mm. just do it You know, don't don't caught up in don't get caught up in the fray. Don't get caught up in the, like you know, run of the mill. You're on the bandwagon. Everybody around you is doing something. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to follow. You know, and you know it's less than ideal, and you're guilty about it, and your conscience is eating you up, and you know you can be better, and you just you know you're just accepting that substandard life for yourself. Mm. You know, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us more freedom than we take that freedom for granted, or we don't realize how much freedom we have. You know. to to do the right thing and to follow the deen but uh, you know we'll keep um, we'll keep advising the youth inshallah we'll keep playing our part as much as possible <coughs> it's a long journey and the parents come in they shouldn't give up and they should you know remind and reiterate the shaitan will never give up mm. so we should try as hard as we can also not to that's uh, that's a, that's an important point there and i think in your wording something i'll touch on with my final message that you said we I think that's the biggest thing uh that it's a collective effort when it comes to to youth and parenting it's just it's not about the the two parents although maybe majority of the time it is but um if the parents can use uh whoever it is that might be close by to assist them then go for it if if you know don't pressure it I've always I've seen uh, with a lot of kids and a lot of parents um they try to pressure their kids into you know maybe being their best friend even though they you know apples and oranges mm-hmm. and if it's just not working mm. so like, you know man grab your cousin or your brother you know or, or someone that's mahram whoever it may be you know if it's female that can relate to your child and can you know find some peace with them and speak to them and have some good guidance etc you know so they shouldn't we shouldn't force it so much as we've probably seen in the past with a lot of parents definitely um and it is a collective thing yeah and the teachers play a role parents play a role even just the being a general guy people out there listening might think you know when i walk past um <coughs> i mean for those who don't live around here won't know but we're, we're from bankstown so when i walk past pork keating park for example and i see you know four or five boys walking around uh smoking and they look 11 12 whatever i think to myself it's none of my business whatever no <laughs> that, that that is my business you know that that i do need to say something or if i you know i do need to advise them and and care because that's someone's child that's someone's you know little baby out there and they don't know what's going on you know and and even it doesn't need to be harsh it can just be soft words like oh you know dear brothers you know i love you guys so much just you know if your parents don't know what you're doing please you know think about it or you know whatever th- whatever the right words may be at that time i might not be the best person for it but what i'm trying to say is it's a group thing and that we all need to care and that you know the parents will do you know x amount of effort and then the kid goes to school so the teachers need to do x amount of effort but then they're also on the street so as a, even as a stranger or a bypasser there's also x amount of effort that you need to do you know to help out and 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 get involved and it doesn't mean getting into everyone's business but it definitely means caring and i think that's the bigger message out there is that ultimately everyone needs to care everyone is a potential parent you know if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them and um for me personally you know i'm i'm not uh, i'm not a parent of an older child um mine's still running around in nappies but it gets you thinking 
you know, what's the future, like, what's the type of community or what's the type of youth that I want for my kids coming up, you know, and if, if uh, no one out there is doing anything about it, then it starts with me, I need to do start doing something about it, I need to make the change myself, you know, it's, it's these hands, it's this mouth, it's this brain that's going to get out there and, you know, start advising and start caring and start making a change in the community and it's just the sunnah of community and society that when one person starts to show a bit of care and love and effort towards something that might be in need, people just latch on mm. and start following you. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, that was beautiful, what you said with the parents. But on my side, <clears throat> I'll say, you know, someone who's not a parent of uh, older kids and maybe just a general member of community, I think for us, the advice I can give for us is that don't be scared to get involved. Don't be scared to have a say and actually care. Care about what these kids are doing. Care about what you see. Even if it is something as simple as making a dua for them. You know, as you said at the start of the show, you know, this uh, the golden child is most of the time just a product of a beautiful dua. That could be it. It could be you seeing the, the troubled teen out there on the street you know what, may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide this kid, may uh, may Allah bless him and, and change his ways. Yeah, and, and it gets accepted and next and thing you know, serious, he's a, Sincerely, yeah. seriously. <coughs> he's a huge, you know, he's a huge business uh, businessman, becomes successful, etc. So, um, to everybody out there, care, care. You know, do what you got to do, say what you need to say, obviously be wise and be smart about it, but do what you need to do to care about you know, the youth and, and the community around us um, because things are going to get better. That's just the way it is. You know, if we all be, be that way, then the positives will come. And, um, you know, before I go, you did mention the, the scripture classes that are out there. For anyone that does have some free time, um, get in touch with the guys that look after the scripture classes out there in the public schools. I know they're always looking. Um, and for the one, you know, maybe for the females that they have some time or the males that are working part-time in particular places. It's half an hour a week. Gets you out there. Uh, these kids might open up to to you. You know, they don't normally op open up to their parents and it gives you a window for your dawah and your uh, advice, obviously after seeking uh, the proper advice from the right people. But uh, it's all about getting involved for me when it comes to, to teens and you know, and the youth in particular. I think everyone plays a part. Yeah. You know, uh, we all need to care. So, um, Hamad, Jazakallahu Khairan for uh, joining me. It was a pleasure having you. I think it was a great discussion. Um, deepest apologies if we offended anyone. We definitely don't mean to say anything towards any parents uh, in the not. wrong way. But uh, all positives here, inshallah. inshallah. And, uh, I hope everyone can take a good, uh, good inshallah. piece. Inshallah. And uh, if if anybody took any uh, verdicts out of me, uh, that wasn't <laughs> as you as you probably tell uh, Nora. I was always making sure that I wasn't making any. Uh, you, covered well, you covered yourself well, don't you? Covered yourself well. You covered yourself well. I'm not in the position to make look, any statements or, or verdicts. Or well, personally, like I said, I'm I not a I'm not a father of of older kids, um, but I have been teaching older ones for. The last two years now, I think some of the advice you gave, no. um, based on the interactions I've had with a lot of parents, I think some of the a lot of the advice you gave actually uh, was quite good. So, um, inshallah, a lot of those out there can implement it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and Eid Mubarak.